There are now over 80,000 cases of the coronavirus in 37 countries and we're going to bring you the latest on how the virus is spreading and how countries are combating it as well as the latest statistics around this crisis. But we're going to begin with the economic consequences of this escalating outbreak because it sparked sharp falls on stock markets for a second day running. The New York Stock Exchange has closed in the last few minutes. These are the pictures coming in and the statistics too. It was trading more than 3% down in the closing minutes. Earlier, Paris, London and Frankfurt all ended the day around 2% lower. Let's go immediately to New York. Samir Hussain is live with us. Um, Samir, help us understand why traders are so concerned. Traders are really worried about some of the things that we talked about yesterday, the potential spread of the coronavirus and how that's going to impact the global economy. But there are other things that happened today. For example, we heard from health officials in the United States that said that Americans should really prepare for a possible outbreak of the coronavirus and that it will be bad. That really sent markets for trading a lot lower today. Other things that have markets really worried rather investors really worried is that there's this general sense from some investors that it is possible that the number of cases in the U.S., although it remains low, uh, we're talking about only 53 confirmed cases of coronavirus, some people are finding it really hard to believe. And now that we're hearing from the CDC that we should prepare for an eventual outbreak of coronavirus in this country, mm. well, that certainly has Wall Street quite spooked. And are there particular sectors which are under particular pressure on the stock market? Look, a lot of sectors are being hurt by it. In particular, you're looking at airlines. They're continuing to suffer tourism and basically any company that has anything to do with China. So if you sell to China, if you buy raw materials from China to make your own goods here in the U.S., all of those companies are being impacted. So it's a variety of things from Apple to Nike to Walt Disney to American Airlines to United. It is really because what happens in China touches so many companies that operate in America. We're seeing quite a widespread impact. Samir, thank you. Let's pick up on some of those issues because however this coronavirus outbreak develops from this point, we can already say with certainty that the economic consequences are going to be enormous. Already, efforts to contain the virus have disrupted supply chains, air travel and a range of cross-border activity. They've also kept millions of workers at home. Let's first hear the analysis of the BBC's Theo Legge. There have been these huge lockdowns, there have been factory stoppages. Factories in China are still at 50, 60 percent. Um, people aren't able to go out and spend money, so the car industry there has taken a tremendous knock. That's affected international companies which sell in China. Um, so there's a lot of damage being done there. Then there's the supply chain. So goods that are manufactured in China would normally be crossing the, the ocean and arriving in Europe and in the United States a few weeks later. Now, we know that a lot of those sailings haven't happened because of restrictions in the ports, because there aren't enough goods to fill the ships. Sailings have been cancelled. Aviation is under particularly severe pressure. One firm called Sirium logs air industry data. It's saying that more than 200,000 flights to and from China have been cancelled since this outbreak began. It's also saying the number of flights scheduled to fly from and within China in February is 80% lower than for the equivalent period last year, 80%. And while China is bearing the brunt of this, this is a global issue. For example, today, Bahrain suspended all flights in and out of Dubai, while passengers and cargo flights from the UAE to Iran have also been cancelled. Let's hear the analysis of Simon Calder from The Independent. Air China, China Southern, uh, China Eastern, particularly suffering. Um, but Hong Kong's airline, Cathay Pacific, is having a terrible time as well in terms of the number of people who no longer wish to transit through Hong Kong, a really important uh, place in the Asia Pacific region. Um, but other airlines, whether from the US, whether from South Asia, Air India, for example, whether from Europe, they are trimming back their Asian uh, operations, particularly into the uh, People's Republic of China, as a result of which the uh, air traffic on some routes um, has been cancelled completely, on many others cut by up to 80%. 
One way to assess the possible economic damage created by this virus is to look at the SARS, another deadly virus which emerged in China in 2002. Back then, factories and businesses closed and it slowed the Chinese economy by 2%. But China's economy and the global economy have changed an awful lot since 2002. Here's a New York Times article saying SARS stung the global economy. The coronavirus is a greater menace. And that's all connected to China's increased economic power. These figures help us understand why. According to the World Bank, China's GDP has increased tenfold between 2002 and last year. It's now worth $13.6 trillion dollars for the same period well you can see the global economy went up and down because of 2008 but over the whole period global trade doubled so an increase but much smaller than the increase in the Chinese economy and for major global businesses now more so than ever they depend on Chinese factories for their production and Chinese consumers for sales here's Theo again well, China can recover. The question is whether those people who've been burnt by supplies from China being disrupted actually want to be as reliant on China as they are at the moment. China is the workshop of the world. It is a cheap place to get things made. But there are alternatives. The garment industry, for example, people can buy from Bangladesh. Um, so a lot of the companies which have been affected by this will be going, well, you know, this has happened once. Maybe we don't want it to happen again. Um, maybe we should have alternative supply chains just in case. And that might hit China in the future. Now, as you'd expect, China's government is trying to counter this impact on its economy. According to Chinese state radio, banking and insurance firms have injected over $100 million into the economy. We also know that Reuters has reported that Beijing is planning a rollout of tax cuts to help business. The FT is here reporting that China's biggest factories are offering big bonuses and even, in some cases, offering to fly people into cities to try and get people back to work. The message from the government's clear. China needs to get moving again. And President Xi is saying people in low-risk areas should be resuming full production and normal life. But that's looking a long way off. These are pictures from Beijing today. Look at the scene on the metro. Very, very few people out. The streets are also quiet. Many shops, restaurants and factories are also closed. And it's been like that for weeks. So what tools are available, not just to individual governments, but also international bodies, to try and mitigate the economic consequences for the global economy? Here's Andrew Walker. Well, it's not all that amenable to the conventional things that governments can do, governments and central banks, I should say, can do to, um, to try and provide some sort of economic stimulus to offset a slowdown in economic growth. Um, the part of the story, I think, is going to be one of um, consumers um, being more wary, being more reluctant to spend money, and to some degree, those things of the conventional tools, interest rate cuts, um, increasing government spending, reducing taxes, they can perhaps help a little bit with that. But if people are simply determined not to travel, not go out, um, then those kind of things are only going to have a rather limited effect. The other point to make is that that's, if you like, about the demand side of the economy. But a lot of the impact is on the other side, the supply side. So disruptions to, um, to people's ability to get to work, to move around for business meetings, to transport goods. Um, and stimulating demand doesn't help very much with that. And I think the one thing that um, perhaps governments can do that really can help with this, and the Chinese have already been doing it to some extent, is to provide um, some short-term lending, essentially, to companies, because many of them will still have their outgoings. They'll be having to pay their staff, their rent, and so forth, but not getting money coming in because they can't produce and sell the goods they normally would. So some sort of short-term lending to tide them over, that kind of problem certainly can help, will help many companies, if not all. So there are some tactics available, but help me put this into context. What's the worst case scenario here? How badly could the global economy be affected by this single virus? Well, very hard to put some concrete numbers on it, but um, and we're certainly not at this stage looking at anything, at anything that looks likely to constitute a global recession. But I suppose if it really were to spread far enough and um, have that much disruption to economic activity it could come to that but at the moment i think what most people are thinking in terms of our um a substantially slower economic growth in the first quarter, perhaps now the first half of the year, mm. 
in China, so maybe by, you know, by two percentage points, slower than would otherwise have been the case, and a smaller but still, still not negligible hit to the global economy. And is it too simplistic for me to see a tension between efforts to restrict the spread of this virus mm. and efforts to protect the global economy? There really is a tension there. Um, the, the bulk of the economic disruption, I think, is going to come from, and has been so far, coming from efforts to contain the spread, stopping people from travelling and ordering factories to close down and so forth, rather than from the direct costs associated with the disease itself. Sure, there are some. I mean, China, for example, has invested quite a lot of money in this extraordinary building, rapid building of, of new health facilities. There's also the, um, the, the, the cost of, um, uh, uh, you know, of, of getting more supplies in to, to deal with the virus. But the bigger economic impact certainly comes from trying to stop it spreading.